Hey everyone, Pastor Kevin, listen, today I have a word from the Lord that I believe is going to be a blessing to your life, strengthen you in your journey. All of us need a shot in the arm in our faith, and I believe that word today is going to do that. Take the next few minutes, spread the word, tell your friends and family this message is coming on. I'm believing it's going to change our lives, and I want you to hang on till the end. I'm going to come back and pray for your needs, and I believe God's going to touch today. Let's jump into this word and be blessed. I'll be back soon. Acts 12, Acts 12, Acts 12. I want to go to the Word of God today. The Lord has been with us. The Athens campus, the Cleveland campus, folk were saved and delivered. How many are thankful? Come on, say amen. I have been meditating on this one for several weeks and chewing on this one for a couple of weeks now. In fact, I was on the rest and the Lord spoke this to me and I have just waited on his timing to preach it and I felt a green light from the Lord this week that today I was to release this. I, I want to preach a message today called Unfulfilled Expectations. And I want to just go ahead and just do something and tell you it's not probably what you're thinking. I am not talking about your expectations being unfulfilled. Because I believe God has a hope and a future and he's going to give you the expectation of the good things that you're desiring from him. I am not talking about the expectations of God being unfulfilled. Because how many know if God decides to do it, the devil can't stop him from doing it. Today I want to talk about the expectation of your enemy being unfulfilled. How many know the devil's got some expectations for your life, but they're not going to come to pass? I hope you're ready for this one. Look at somebody, tell them, neighbor, the devil does not have the final say in your life. Tell them, instead of you going home disappointed, the devil is going to be disappointed today. I feel something getting ready to happen for somebody in this room. Somebody say yeah. Acts 12 verse 1. Unfulfilled expectations. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Pay attention to that, please. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending, somebody say intending, intending to bring him before the people after Passover, say after Passover. Mm. But Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and light shone in the prison and he struck Peter <laughs> on the side, hit by an angel. And he raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first, they passed. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate of the city that leads to the city, which opened to them, opened to them, opened. It opened of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for a certainty that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod, look here, and from all of the expectations of the Jewish people. God delivered me out of the expectation 
of my enemy. Look at this. So he considered this thing and came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. As Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. They said to her, you are beside yourself. One translation said, you are mad, you are crazy. Yet she kept insisting. How many know if you've heard the voice, you don't have to doubt it. Keep on insisting that you saw and you heard what you saw and you heard. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he motioned with his hand to keep silent. And he declared to them how the Lord brought him out of prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and he went to another place. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. My subject is found in the 11th verse of that text. It says, he knew now that God had delivered him from the hand of Herod and the expectation of the Jewish people. I want to declare over you the enemy has some expectations about your future, but they will remain unfulfilled. I said the enemy's expectation about your future shall remain unfulfilled. If you believe God is good, say amen. amen. Father, bless the people. Give us grace to teach, preach, and receive the word of the Lord. Crown the house with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ. I pray for eyes to come open, ears to come open. May I speak freely and with accuracy, with unction and authority, the word of God. And I thank you the word has free course in this house. Now, Lord, I give you my ears to speak to and my mouth to speak through. Have your way in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. And about that time, Herod stretched forth his hand. About that time, Herod stretched forth his hand to harass certain people in the church. It's interesting to me that from Matthew to Mark to Luke to John, and now in the book of Acts, we see this reoccurring uh, resurgence, this name that seems to uh, be found in every chapter of what God was doing in the New Testament, and it is the name Herod. Herod was present when Jesus was born and the wise men came and said, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And they said that we saw his star in the east and when Herod the king heard it, it drove him mad and he did something unprecedented. He, 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 in his day, he killed all the male children to and under trying to kill Jesus because he understood that Jesus was a king. This was Herod the Great. If you flip the book a few chapters, you will find that there is another Herod. His name is Herod Antipas, and he is the king, King Herod, responsible for the slaying of John the Baptist. And then if you keep flipping the page, you will come to this 12th chapter of Acts where there is Herod um, uh, uh, Agrippa, and Herod Agrippa is now killing James, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he decides, I'm going to put Peter in prison, and I'm going to kill him also. And what I want you to see is that it doesn't matter which Herod it was, every Herod who steps into this role as this king is maniacally possessed wanting the power, the approval, and the authority uh, of, of, of his nation and his people. And so he will do whatever he has to do to make the people happy so that he stays in power. This is what happens when you get government that gets corrupt. If you're not careful, you will find corrupt people who are maniacally possessed with power and whatever they find that makes the people happy, they are trying to keep the people happy even if it means attacking the church. The Bible said that he killed James and put Peter in prison with an intention to kill Peter after unleavened bread and after uh, the feast of Passover. And he did this because it made the Jewish people happy. And so I don't have time to go into um, 
James, the depth of James' death. It bothers some people when they read this text that God would allow James to die. But I want you to understand that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saint. And you need to understand, we may be bent out of shape about James dying, but James was all right dying for the Lord because there are some things worth dying for. We don't have that revelation in modern church. We're all about our own independence, our own freedom. We're all about expressing our voice and we're all about preserving our life. But the early church said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when they threatened James, James was not intimidated by the sword of Herod. He decided, for God I live and for God I die. When I read this story, I was reminded of the story they told of an early church father named Polycarp. Polycarp was a powerful teacher in his day. This is in the early church. You won't find his name in the Bible, but he was a student and a disciple of the apostles. And the, and the story goes that they come to give Polycarp an option to renounce Jesus and live or to keep on trusting him and they would burn him at the stake. They came and they lit the fire and his family is standing there watching the flames burn and they're threatening Polycarp and saying, if you don't deny Jesus, then we're going to burn you at the stake. His son looked up at his father. He looked up and said to Polycarp, dad, what are you going to do? They're going to burn you if you don't renounce Jesus. And Polycarp looked back at his son and said, son, have no fear. Tonight I'm dining with the king. I want you to understand that there are some things worth dying for. And until the church loses its fear of death and loves Jesus, Jesus, beyond even death itself, it will, ne it will never become the entity that makes hell nervous. It will never be the kind of church that makes hell nervous. But if when you are threatened and if when you are harassed and if when you are opposed by the enemy, you decide come hell or high water, I'm still going to keep my trust in God. For God I live and for God I die. When you make up your mind to live like that, hell doesn't know what to do with somebody who is not afraid of death itself. And I preach this and I told you this, we are in the midst of the wussification of the church. And now we bow out and stop following Jesus because somebody talked about us on Facebook or because somebody hurt our feelings in the church. Let me walk around here and tell you that what Jesus died on the cross to give me is not something I'm going to throw away because you don't like me. In fact, I didn't even know you didn't like me and I'm not even interested and neither do I care if you like me. I don't belong to you. I'm a child of the living God and I refuse to throw my inheritance away because somebody is trying to hinder me in my journey. You need to do what the Bible said in the book of Revelation. See to it that nobody steals your crown. Look at somebody tell them I'm not losing my crown. I might lose friends, but I'm not losing my crown. I might lose fans, but I'm not losing my crown. I might lose followers on Facebook, but I will not lose my crown. I'm going to stand before the King of glory one day, and I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So James... He did die at the hands of Herod and his sword. James is doing all right today. James is alive and Herod is dead. We got to get this thing right in the church. Death for the child of God. I'm telling you, and we're gonna, we, we need to start preaching on heaven and hell more. I'm not through walking. We need to preach on it some more because some people think they're gonna live forever and then when death starts settling in, they think, oh God, how am I gonna prevent this? I don't care if you're 120. One day, if Jesus tarries, you and I are going to die on this side and cross over. You don't ever need to let the devil make you feel that when you leave this side, it's over. When you leave this side and you step through the portal called death, that's what Billy Graham said, when I die on this side, don't let anybody tell you Billy Graham is dead. When I die on this side, I'll step into life and I'll be alive more than I've ever been before. We need to get a fresh perspective and remind the devil, you can't kill me. You can't put your hands on God's stuff and God is not through with my life. So James died, he was a martyr. 
And when he saw that it pleased the Jewish people, Herod said, okay, I'm, if that makes them happy, I'm going to kill Peter too. So I'm going to put him in jail. And the reason he puts him in jail is because it's during the Passover feast. And he waited till the Passover feast was over because he knew if he, ki- he couldn't kill a prisoner during Passover because it would incite a riot. Peter is spared because of Passover. I thought that was a decent point. It was actually the celebration of the lamb that kept Peter from dying. It was the blood of the lamb that kept Peter. I know he's on death row, but he ain't dead yet. And the reason he's on death row and he's not dead yet is because it's Passover time and they're waiting because they're celebrating the blood of the lamb. I just want to tell somebody in this room that the only reason we haven't died and the only reason we ain't dead and the only reason it isn't over is because of the Passover lamb. God is protecting you. The blood is speaking on your behalf and the lamb you better hear what I'm telling you I know that the devil is a dragon but Jesus is the lamb and the lamb is standing between you and the dragon and he's telling death I ain't through with him yet I ain't through with her yet I know you want to put your hands on them but you can't touch this because if the blood is on your life the devil cannot have you And so he's, he's in a holding place. It's Passover and he's on death row. And Herod has designed this entire scenario to keep the people happy. He will kill Peter. And he has these expectations that tomorrow morning, I'm going to drag him into the city square and I'm going to kill him. Now, you need to understand that the first part of this text says something powerful. It said, Herod, this is, again, not the Herod of of the Gospels. This is his great-grandson. And and, and it is this Herod that he puts his hands, he stretched forth his hands to touch and harass certain members of the church. He did not stretch his his hand forth to harass everybody only certain members of the church. Let me talk to the certain members. I cannot talk to the people who Satan isn't worried about because if you're not a threat to the devil, the devil is not worried about you. But if you have been feeling harassed lately and you have been feeling a bit of opposition lately, if you have just felt that little harassing thing trying to rise up over here in that relationship, over there in that relationship, your money got funny, come on, your sleep got crazy, your relationships in your house, they're just some funky stuff you're having to work through and you wonder what is all this? Every time I turn around it just feels like I'm getting harassed. I'm going to tell you what it is. It is not an indication that you're cursed. It is not an indication indication that God is not with you. It is not an indication that you are not favored. It is an indication and a reminder that there's something on my life that hell sees that sometimes I don't even see and while I'm up here trying to wonder about how to be blessed, Satan is so terrified if I ever step in my identity and become everything God called me to be. That's why the kids are acting crazy. That's why the money got funny. That's why the job has been an issue. That's why relationships have been going through because Satan is just trying to harass. I don't know where the certain members of the church are. I came to talk to the certain people. You are not crazy. You are not losing your mind. You are not in trouble. You are not about to die. You are about to come into a revelation of why the enemy Enemy stayed up all night long to hinder you in the first place. He just harasses. It's an old harassing spirit. It just sometimes every time you turn around, you're like, doggone, I just dealt with that. 
I mean, I just come overcome that. I just worked through that. I just got that fixed. I just got that one repaired. I just healed that thing. And now all of a sudden, another thing. What is this? What is this? It's just the hand of Herod. The hand of Herod stretched out to harass. And James is dead. Peter's on death row. So the church calls a prayer meeting. I want to ask the question, how bad does it have to get before somebody in this room starts a prayer meeting? I mean, the reality of it is we should have been praying before anybody died. The reality of it is we should have been praying before COVID hit. The reality of it is we should have been praying before we got in financial trouble. But since we hadn't had a prayer life, maybe it's going to take a little bit of opposition to stir up the fighter on the inside. So they pray. And they do what my old church did when I was a boy growing up. They had a prayer chain. Now, I know we can't do this with, you know, three or 4,000 members, but when I was growing up, we had 100 people in my church. So the pastor could call everybody. Sister Ye Ye, we're going to meet tomorrow night and have a prayer meeting. I'm talking about not even announce, just start calling people. Before we had text, we just pick up the phone with a cord, walk through the kitchen with it. <laughs> We're going to have to pray. Sister, sister so-and-so done got sick. Brother so-and-so done got a bad report. We need to have a prayer meeting. So we call people, and it wasn't no massive mega church, but we get 50 people to come to prayer. And I'm telling you right now, when them 50 people came in there, they didn't bring in no Twitter. They didn't bring in no Facebook. They didn't bring in no, oh, we're going to put this on Instagram Live. Oh, no, there wouldn't have been no Instagram Live because what you see in those kind of places are something called desperation. It's something called hunger and what and now when we broadcast hunger people have the unmitigated goal to criticize and they talk about stuff they don't understand and they make fun of people who are weeping and crying and rolling in a floor but when cancer hits your body and when depression gets on your house and when divorce comes knocking at your door you don't need somebody that's just got a blue check mark that knows how to go live you need somebody to turn off the phone and tell the devil you miss with the wrong church, Jack. Greater is he who that is in us than he that's in the world. And on one side of the church, they'd be pleading the blood. On the other side of the church, they would bind the hands of the devil. It took a little while, but the prayer wheel got turning. And before you know it, cancer started disappearing. Joy got restored to the church. My God, we need a prayer meeting. Slap somebody, tell them I command a praying spirit on you. God is about to give you a mantle of prayer. God's going to birth in you a heart of prayer. Yes. They started praying. Now, let me teach. Now get me all excited here. They call a prayer meeting, and when they started praying, heaven got involved. Well, you know, does my prayer, I, I, we had a breakfast yesterday morning with some Cleveland brothers, and we had 200 brothers show up. And I told them, brothers, I'm going to tell you what I told them. I'm going I'm to decree this over you. We are all, look at your neighbor say he's talking to you. We are all about to get to, about to get 10% better in prayer. Just 10%, just 10%. Well, you know, he puts so much pressure, he, so much pressure to be some deep intercessor. I don't like prayer. Well, you're about to get 10% better. Just 10%. Just 10%. I'm not even giving you how long you ought to pray. I'm not trying to put a, a yoke on you. I am telling you, you're about to enjoy prayer 10% more. You're about to get 10% more answers. You're about to spend 10% more in time. Well, I don't spend much. It's okay. It's going to get 10% better. 
you are about to find out that 10 minutes with God isn't long enough. Oh, I, I run out of stuff to say. It's because you're praying out of your mind. Oh my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. But what's about to happen is that you're about to start praying out of your spirit. And when you start praying out of your spirit, you find out there's not enough time in the day. It's why Paul said pray without ceasing. I need to be able to pray not just when I'm in a prayer meeting, but when I'm in Walmart, I'm praying. And when I'm driving through the school zone, I'm praying. And when I'm washing clothes at the dish, at the, and I'm washing dishes, I'm still praying. Everywhere I turn, I'm praying. Because my Bible said that when I pray, the Bible said in Jeremiah 33, if you call unto me, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Slap your neighbor, tell him a praying spirit. Calm down. They started, they started a prayer meeting. Let me help you understand something. This house, the most important meeting in this house is our prayer meeting. We have meetings all week long. Meetings upon meetings. All of them are significant. All of them help us get the job done. All of them advance the kingdom. But the most important meeting of the week is the prayer meeting. So they pray. Watch this. You ready for this? They're praying for Peter. And what is he doing? <sighs> Sleeping. Wait a minute. Can you please be as worried, Peter, as we are about you? Because we're worried. We stand up all night long. We got the prayer chain going. We pray, pray. Oh, God, deliver Peter. God, deliver Peter. God, deliver Peter. I'm tired. Okay, get Sister Yay Yay. She's going to come and catch up. Oh, God, deliver Peter. Oh, God, deliver Peter. And Brother Yay Yay, Brother Flip Flop, come on in here and pray. Oh, God, deliver Peter. Father, in the name of Jesus, deliver Peter. We pray. Peter is sleeping. Why are you sleeping when everybody else is praying for you? There, I read this week, I read all kinds of commentary so that I could fi uh, find a, a reason why Peter was sleeping. Obviously, and without question, the most important reason why is he is tired. <laughs> it's after midnight. Da -da 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 -da. Never mind. All y'all 80s people, y'all like, woo! <laughs> He's tired. But there's something deeper going on here. He might be sleeping because he's already been broken out of prison once. Y'all know he has been a prisoner before. He was incarcerated. <laughs> And while he's in prison with all of his preaching friends for preaching, the angel come and gets them out and they walk right back into the city square and picked up the sermon where they left off before they threw him in jail. And I think a little bit, maybe one of the reasons why he is sleeping is because he knows God did this before. He can get me out again. Tell your neighbor, say, hey neighbor. Tell him, God did this once before. He healed me once before. He delivered me once before. He brought me out once before. He made a way once before. I'm not trying to act arrogant. I'm not even trying to act presumptuous, but I'm starting to get an idea that if God before me, who can be against me? I'm starting to get the idea that no weapon formed against me shall be, uh-huh, if I go through one more valley, I'm liable to come out of that valley thinking that when God says it's my season, nobody who's standing in my way can stop me, no devil can hinder. Tell somebody, tell them I believe in the faithfulness of God. My God, I feel like preaching. I believe in the faithfulness of God. I'm not feeling good about it because of what I did. I'm feeling good about it because this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. It is the mercy of the Lord that we are not consumed. Somebody shout yes. But that's 
probably not why he's sleeping. He is sleeping because in John 21, verse 18, sitting at a fireside, a fireside chat, Jesus looks at him and says, you're going to live to be an old man. And Peter looked at himself in the prison on death row. And he said, I ain't old yet. Look at somebody, tell them, I ain't old yet. Yeah, I see you sweet 80 year old folk in here talking by faith, you ain't old yet. Don't you let the devil tell you it's over. I ain't old yet. God is not done with me. I remember having COVID. Many of you were part of my journey through that. I remember laying in my bed, oxygen dropping to 75, 80. Couldn't breathe. They did a chest x-ray, showed me my lungs full. There were just some stripes where it was clear. i never forget, I still got the picture, but they showed me my lungs and my lungs were filled with those shards that were preventing people from having oxygen exchange on the surface of their lung. I went and saw a pulmonologist and he took a picture of my lungs and he said, this is a healthy lung and it's opaque, you can see through it. And he showed me my lung, it was full of white clouds, except there were a few stripes. And I read a scripture that said, by his stripes, I am healed. So he said, I can't explain why your whole lung is not filled, but you have some stripes of healthy tissue. I said, all I need is the stripes. I'm, I'm shouting over the stripes this morning. Come on, somebody. And, and I'm laying in the bed, and my oxygen keeps dropping every time I get up, and I, I had gotten um, dehydrated. I didn't sleep for 72 hours, not a wink. 72 hours, I laid in the bed, stared at the ceiling, having thoughts. I'll never see my baby girls get married. I'll never graduate. I think I'll never see them graduate. I did graduate by the grace of God. <laughs> my, gra my wife graduated cum laude. I graduated, thank the laude. I remember laying in the bed thinking, I'm gonna miss my church. I'm gonna miss all those faces because I couldn't breathe. And then I got real sad when I thought, the Vols are gonna win the national championship. <laughs> and I'm not gonna be alive to see it. <laughs> but this is the year. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway. I was laying in my bed. Fear gripped my life about death. And here's what broke me through. Pastor Kim had called me a little bit before COVID started and a prophet in Guatemala saw a vision of me in prayer. And I had to call Kim who called the pastor from Guatemala because he don't speak English. And I only habla piquito espanol, see. Me habla piquito espanol, taco de burrito, nacho, taco barilla, si? Queso, verde, amarillo, rojo. Gloria a Dios. Dios es bueno todo tiempo, that's it. I said every Spanish word I know right there, I'm done. Okay, so I don't know Spanish, he don't know English, Kim gets in between us and she's relaying this prophetic word. And he says, I see you as an old man sitting in a chair and there's a globe in front of you and God has given you a net to throw across a globe. And he said, everywhere the net intersects, I see little light beams shooting up into the heavens. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I had forgotten that word until I was laying in my bed, afraid I was about to die. And I wasn't really afraid to die. I just didn't want not to see my babies. 
And that word came like a like a like a sword it come running in my spirit. And when I remembered that prophet saw me as an old man, my oxygen it's down in the high 70s. I got out of my bed and crawled. Y'all couldn't have handled this, but I crawled down the hallway and I crawled into the lobby of my house and I opened up the front door and I pulled myself up that door on the handle and I opened that door and I said, Devil, get out of my house. I shall live, oh shit, Rabbi. I shall live and I shall not die and I will declare the work of the Lord. Somebody said, what happened next? I almost passed out. My oxygen dropped. I said, oh, I don't feel so good and I crawled back to bed. <laughs> but something happened when I kicked that devil out of my house. I'm telling you right now, the word of the Lord will cause you to rest when everything around you is shaking. There is a reason Peter had the ability to sleep while he's living on death row because Jesus told him, you're gonna be an old man. And Peter said, I'm not old yet. And if I'm not old yet, I don't know how I'm getting up out of this, but I'm getting up out of this. I shall live and not die. Slap three people, tell them I shall live. Say it out of your mouth, I shall live. In this next season, you shall live. Not just exist, not just survive, not just make it through. You are gonna live. For I heard the word of the Lord say, I came that you might have a life. Ooh, and that you might have it more abundantly. Shake hands with four people, tell them live, live, live. Live, 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 live. Somebody say live, 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 live. Shake hands with three more people. Tell them live, 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 live. Look at your neighbor in the eye. Tell them live, 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 live. The devil expects you to lay down. The devil expects you to throw in the towel. The devil expects you to quit coming to church. The devil expects you to quit trusting God. But for God I live. But somebody tell him live, live, live. Take a 15 second live, 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 live. Praise him like you got living plans. I know the devil's got funeral plans, but somebody praise God like you've got living plans. Somebody holler, I shall live. I know the enemy's got my gravestone, but I shall live. I'm coming out of this, I shall live. Oh. shall live. He rested. He rested because he knew. Somebody help me take a, I'm gonna live. 15 second praise, pray. Cut your feet loose, open up your mouth and praise God like you're gonna live. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sit with me. Let me get through this. Ooh. Oh, Lord. He. Well, why do y'all do that? Why do y'all do that? It gets on my nerves. You get on our nerves. If he brought you out of the fire, he brought us, brought us out of. 
and not one, not one hair on my head was singed, and the smell of smoke wasn't even on my life. Somebody give him a hand gonna live, praise Brad. I cancel every death plan you've been thinking about and I declare that the Holy Ghost is going to quicken you this morning. Touch your neighbor, say you're coming back to life. You're coming back to life. You're coming back to life. How? Live, 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 live. Now let me, let me. Let me finish this because we're, he didn't bring us this far not to finish this now. Watch this. Peter's on death row. Woo! You keep going, keep having them flashbacks that'll make you a praiser. Peter is on death row, an angel shows up, and light breaks into a prison. I don't even have time but light breaks into the prison. And the Bible said, Peter was sleeping so deep that the angel smote him. What is it like to be touched by an angel? God done sent me down here to get you. You ain't going to be able to sleep through this. Get up. Now, this is crazy. The angel gets into the prison without being traced. And Peter is standing there locked up between two guards, one on the right. The guard had a chain on him, and the chain led to the right arm of Peter. And on the left, there was another guard with a chain that's that that chained to Peter's left arm. He is literally chained to two men and surrounded by 16 soldiers. And suddenly the angel appears, struck him, and the Bible said, he told Peter in the Wall of Sinai authorized translation, get up. But then he looks at Peter, and when Peter stands up, watch, it said the chains fell down. Where did the key come from? There wasn't one. Because when God decides to get you out, you don't need no man to turn a key. God will just break that thing off your life. And this is where I think it's crazy. He looks at Peter and says, dress yourself. God will break you out of the prison, but you got to put your clothes on. And before you think I'm just being funny, you can't be free if you ain't rightly clothed. Because what kind of God would it be to, to release an apostle with no clothes on out in the street? And some people want to be free, but they don't want to put on the right garments. Oh, I'm not going to get no help. It is why God told the disciples to get the gray clothes off Lazarus. Uh huh. Jesus didn't put the gray clothes on Lazarus. He looked at the disciples who wrapped them up and said, get that off him. Why? You can't walk around a testimony for God living in some gray clothes. And you can't walk around the streets of the city talking about I'm an apostle and you ain't got no clothing. So he said, put your clothes on. 
tie your sandals on. And the chains fall off and then they walk past the first guard and the second guard and nobody sees them. Miracles. But this is where it gets crazy. He comes to the gate of the city. Chains falling off your wrist, that's personal. Walking past the first and the second guard post, that's amazing. But you get to the gate of the city, everybody's watching the gate of the city. It's late at night, yeah, but there are guards who are responsible to make sure the gate of the city stays safe. And the Bible said the chains fell off, no key. They walk past the first and second guard, nobody sees them. They get to the gate that led to the city. Read your Bible. It said the gate opened on its own accord. And I looked at that word in the Greek, Pastor Richie. It is the Greek word. It's only used a couple of times. It's the Greek word automatos. It's where we get the English word automatic. I'm getting ready to preach right here. All of us have doors. Doors to your car, doors to your house, doors to the bathroom, doors to the restaurant you're going to eat at today. Doors to get out this building. There are big doors, exit doors everywhere. All these doors you see, you have to push on the door to get through it. But when Peter came to the door that led to the city, read the Bible. It said it opened of its own automatos. Let me tell you this. When you get to your car today, you're going to open your car door get into your car or your truck or whatever you got and you're going to shut the door. When you get home, you're going to unlock the door, twist the handle and you're going to push the door and the door is going to open. When you go to the restroom, you're going to open the door. You're going to go in and use the restroom and shut the door behind you. But when you go to Walmart, When you go to Walmart, you don't go up and push on the door at Walmart. All you got to do when you go to Walmart is step in the right place. And when you walk up to the door at Walmart, I feel like preaching in Chattanooga, and you step in the right place, there is a sensor over the door that senses your arrival. When you get to the right place, that door don't need you to push. That door don't wait on you to pull. That door opens automatically. It's just waiting on you to get there. Touch your neighbor. I know we gotta go get some chicken, but touch your neighbor and tell your neighbor in this next season of your life, doors are getting ready to open up for you. You're not gonna have to open it. You're not gonna have to push on it. You're not gonna have to pull on it. God told me to tell somebody, all you gotta do is show up. Slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, show up. Show up in the middle of hell breaking loose. Show up in the middle of a bad doctor's report. Show up when it looks like the enemy's coming against your family. If you will show up, doors are getting ready to open in your life. Shout if I'm talking to you in this church. Business doors are opening. Financial doors are opening. Relationships are coming together. God is about to hook you up. God is about to open, 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 open. He's just waiting on you to get to the door. And the censor is about to say, oh, they're here now. I know y'all tired of me dancing today, but there's some people getting ready to come out of one season into another kind of season, and it's going to happen automatically. It's going to happen automatically. Touch three people and tell them automatically. I just open it up, open it up, open it up. Holy Ghost, open it up.
stand with me. I got to end with this. There's so much in this text. I might preach it again next Sunday. It said he went through the gate, walked through the city, and got on a certain road, and the angel disappeared. Why would the angel disappear? Because the angel came to get him out, but the angel will never do for you what God called you to do for yourself. So the angel, oh Lord, the angel lifts and disappears. And Peter says, I'm gonna go to Mary's house because I know where they're praying. So he goes to Mary's house, watch this. The church prayed him out of prison. Do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? The church prayed him out of prison. He shows up at the church. And Rhoda, the assistant of the prayer meeting, said, oh, I hear somebody knocking. Let me go see who this is. She goes to the door. She doesn't see Peter. She hears his voice. Read the text. Something about the voice of the apostolic activated her understanding to know prayers have been answered. But she goes in to tell the church. Peter's here. You know, the one y'all been praying for for 24 hours. He's here. And the church that's been praying looks at her and says, you are crazy. And she said, no, y'all don't understand. It wasn't no bad pizza. It wasn't nothing cray cray. He's here, I heard him. And they said, okay, you're not crazy, but it is his angel. She ain't crazy. They're crazy. So what does, what does Peter keep doing? Finally, they go to the door. And what do you know? The one they were praying for was trying to get into the church. But the church that prayed him in kept him out. And this is where the modern church is. We keep praying for people to come to church. And then when they come knocking on the door, Oh, no, 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 that's the LGBTQ community. They can't come in. Oh, no, 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 that's racist people. They can't come in. Oh, no, 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 they didn't vote like me. They can't come in. Oh, no, 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 they ain't the same color as me. They can't come in. You better stop praying if you don't want them to come in. But if you ever start, my God, I felt that. I felt that. I felt that. I felt that. Has anybody been praying? I said, has anybody been praying? Then slap your name and tell them, open up the door and let them in. Let them in. Let them in. Somebody holler, let them in. Watch, I'm through, I promise. That Julian today. That's my guy. He wants me to sweat. I feel like Richard Simmons. Got my workout in today. Watch. They open the door and they go crazy. He says, shh, shh, shh. I would say he uses his hands. I don't want to go back to jail. So I says, he tells me to go tell James and the brethren, and then he leaves and goes to another place. And that's where I thought I was going to stop till I got in this room today. I feel you, Holy Ghost. Thank you. I kept on reading right before I walked up to preach. If you keep reading that same chapter, it says this, Herod went to another city. The same Herod that stretched out his hands to vex the church and harass them. That man went to the next city and they started calling him a God and he didn't rebuke them. And the 
Bible said an angel, God, I feel like preaching. An angel brought Peter out of prison, but an angel struck that wicked king and Herod died as worms ate his body. Read your Bible. What's the point? Why would you end with that? Because Peter lived and Herod died. Let me go one step further. The king that they crucified on Sunday, on Friday, and raised up on Sunday, that king, his name is Jesus, is still alive, and Herod is still dead. I'm trying to tell you, you mess with God's people, and the hand of the Lord will cut you off. So, I'm not cursing nobody. I don't want nobody to die. I'm just telling you. You mess with God's anointed and God will take it personally. Herod is dead. Jesus is alive. If you're in this room today and you need God to set you free from anything, I don't care if you're saved for 30 years and it's depression, anxiety, I don't care if you just got saved last week and you're still struggling with drug addiction. If you got a hidden thing, whatever your chain is, you're not going to die from this. God's going to deliver you from the expectation. The enemy expects you to keep staying bound, but the devil is leaving with some unfulfilled expectations today. I almost let go. I felt like I just couldn't take life anymore. The devil thought he had me, but Jesus came and grabbed me. And he held me close <laughs> so I wouldn't let go of my Bashaya. God's mercy kept me. <laughs> Wish I had a witness in the church. So I wouldn't let go. So I'm here today because God kept me. <laughs> And I'm alive today just because of his grace. He kept me. God kept me. Sing, Abby. Somebody say yes. Hallelujah. So I would let go. How many are thankful he kept you today? And somebody knows, needs to know this. He has kept you even when you felt like you were next to die. You are next, but it's not to die. You are next to live. If I preached to you at all today and you know you need a chain broken off of you, and you need to come up out of your prison and walk in your purpose. Come out of your seat right now and get to the altar. Hurry. Yeah, 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 yeah. My God, my God, I need some worshipers to throw hands up right now. I just need some worshipers and some people with thanksgiving to throw those hands up and say, He kept me, He kept me, He kept me, He kept me, God. God really did, He really did, He really did. I'm coming out of this prison today. Listen, if you gotta go, we love you. Get the babies, have a blessed week. We'll see you Wednesday night. But everybody who's staying, I want you to throw those hands up right now and begin to pray and begin to worship and begin to give God glory as he begins to set the captive free and chains begin to break. Come on, come on, Julian, come on. Sing it again. God kept me. Jesus. 
Hey family, I believe God is touching hearts right now. The preached word of God causes the lost to come to Christ. I believe someone's watching. Maybe you feel a million miles away from God. Maybe you've been in church. Maybe you've never been in church. Listen, I want to tell you that it doesn't matter where you are in life right now. If you want Christ to save you, no matter what you've done and no matter how long you've been doing it, if you'll turn your heart to him, he'll save you right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. Say, dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I'm asking you to save me from my sin. Save me from myself. Lord, come in and be the king of my life. I give you my past, my present, and my future. And I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to rescue me today. In Jesus' name, by faith, I believe that I'm saved and a child of God. Amen. Listen, friend. I know that's a simple prayer, but I believe with all of my heart, salvation is as simple as turning from sin and turning to Christ. If you did that today, I, I want to pray that God give you a strong Bible-believing church. I want you to go to KevinWallace.tv, learn how the resources that we have can help you in your journey. Listen, we want to pray for you. Drop us a line on the prayer request. Let us know you gave your heart to Christ, and our team's going to be praying for you this coming week. You're going to get stronger. You're going to grow deeper in your love for God. You're going to become everything he put you on this planet to be. I'm praying for you. I love you. I'll see you next week. God bless.